On the 12th of March 2022, a planned hazard reduction burn was ignited in the Warby Ovens National Park. This park is the only green listed park in the entire state of Victoria. The reason for that? It's outstanding natural value, amazing habitat for many threatened species of flora and fauna. Once the fire was lit, the fire just spread and it burnt for a number of days and our worst fears became a reality. On coming to the fire ground, there were just hundreds if not thousands of old trees now on the ground, burnt and incinerated, all these hollows destroyed. The fire has gone outside the designated burn zone. It has been an absolute and utter catastrophe. To understand why this failure happened, I'm going to talk to a couple of local ecologists that were part of our group. I'm going to ask them how this area was selected. What happened after the burn? What damage was done? And what suggestions we have so this never happens again? First, I think it's important that we understand why this habitat is so special. Why does it have this green listing? What species does it support? I asked Chris Saros and Ian Davison to share their knowledge of this area. This is a really special part of the Warby Ovens National Park. This is a particularly good site here where the, the trees are really widely spaced. There's some really old specimens here that are 200 plus years old hollow bearing, lots of logs on the ground. There's not too many places like this through the Warbies. So this particular site here, you've got lots of open herbaceous cover, grasses, a nice open woodland setting for uh, various woodland birds, hooded robins, speckled warblers, diamond firetails, these sorts of things, a lot of the, the rare and declining species of woodland birds. The logs that we see in amongst the, the, the rocky outcrops, ideal habitat for tree goannas. Uh, this location is also really good for sand goanna, Burton snake lizard. There's even been yellow-faced whip snake recorded at this site. So really high ecological values in this open rocky woodland setting. So this is ideal carpet python habitat here. So the carpet python is, is a really significant species. It is listed as threatened in Victoria, while the Warby Ranges supports one of the most significant populations anywhere in the state. One of the reasons being is that we have this, this beautiful granite outcrop habitat, so they like to bask on the, the, the cooler mornings uh, and evenings. They use the hollows in the mature trees here as den sites, one of the best spots in the Warbies that I know of for carpet pythons. This site was one of the best examples of old growth, long unburnt areas with very large trees, multiple hollows. And the value of the, the large old trees, because of their large size, they dominate the architecture of the woodland. They ensure that young trees don't uh, regenerate, so you have a relatively open woodland. As habitat goes, it's the ideal. So considering this park has a green listing, considering all of these ecological values, I'm surprised that it was selected to be burnt. So I asked Ian how this came about. How was the site selected? So once we learnt that there was to be a burn and the burn was going to occur here, a group of concerned citizens formed a, an informal group that tried to engage with both Parks Victoria as the land manager and DELP as the fire controller. We met with them several times and we outlined what our concerns were, potential for environmental damage. So through the process of engaging with both DELP and Parks Victoria, we learnt how this area was identified as needing, or as, as occurring as an area that was going to be burnt. And that was through a statewide risk analysis uh, modelling process. From our perspective, it had very little to do with what the actual values were on the site. It was identified primarily because of the potential to cause catastrophic risk for landholders that were on the eastern side of this range. A number of those landholders are actually in our group who did not see the need for the burn. Uh, we had several meetings with with those authorities, which were all respectful and we tried to get meaningful change. They acknowledged that uh, we had some legitimate concern and that's shown on their fire management map. Uh, now, unfortunately, the results were quite different to what was on the map. So from our perspective, we see this as a complete failure. So even after highlighting all our concerns and meeting with the authorities and forewarning the potential for devastation here, the fire went ahead anyway. So I caught up with Ian and Chris on the fire grounds just to see what sort of damage has occurred. So this is an example of one of these mature hollow bearing trees that's come down as a result of the fire. There was inadequate protection at the base of this tree. This is one example of many 
that's right across this hill slope here. As I said, these are trees a couple of hundred plus years old. You know, this one's a, a, a metre at, uh, in diameter and it's been, it's been brought to the ground. Uh, it's such a waste. As a result of these um, branches coming down, all the finer fuel, the, the leaves, the, 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 the smaller sticks are now at ground level. So we've got a, a higher fuel load than, than was here to start with. Just in a, ineffective from a fuel reduction point of view for sure. As a result of these hollow bearing trees coming down, there's a range of hollow using fauna, possums, gliders, bats, kookaburras, parrots, cockatoos, owl at night jars, all of these things now lost a lot of that habitat at this particular site. These hollow bearing trees have just crashed to the ground after the fire. So from a fuel management point of view, the burning has been a fail because not only it didn't remove a lot of fine fuels because there weren't a lot on the site, but what it's done is it's actively contributed to there being more fuel. Like if you look at this area here, that this was a formerly standing tree. So it was upright, green leaves, and now it's fallen along with thousands of others on the ground and contributes to a very major fire risk until it rots down. So this here is a large ring of stones, which looks like it's been constructed but it is in fact the base of where a large dead tree stood. The fire's got into it, it's burnt it out, and then it's fallen over, and it's burnt away completely. It's completely obliterated, leaving nothing but a charcoal silhouette on the ground. So the area behind me shows the extent of canopy damage and leaf fall. So it shows you all of those leaves, dead leaves in the, in the trees behind me are going to fall on the ground and they will more than make up for the fuels that have been lost. So this small section of unburnt ground gives you an idea of the, the fine fuel that the authorities were hoping to control. And if we look next to it, this area that was just burnt uh, less than two weeks ago is now already starting to fill up with leaf litter within two weeks. Give it another year for next season and it will absolutely have as much ground fuel as that. So it's, it's quite obvious the damage from the fire can easily be seen around us in um, the loss of all these mature hollow bearing trees, but the loss of that habitat will continue in, in the months ahead. The likes of this big old fella here, it's burnt out at the base. The next strong winds we get in the spring, this tree is highly likely to come down. The, the, the structure of it's been compromised. Um, it's burnt out completely at the base here. Uh, this tree will come down and be, be lost as, as a habitat resource as well, just like all the other old ones here around us. So one of the most common effects that occurred is when the fire creeps up to the base of the tree, it actually finds a hole, a hollow, or a, an area of dead wood, then burns from the, from the base, and it causes this, where uh, a, this is a Blakely's red gum, which was about that size, that diameter. It had multiple hollows. It burns until the fire's gone past, but it continues to burn for sometimes days, and then it collapses. And this has happened for hundreds of trees on this site, potentially thousands. So this is an example of, it, it, it wasn't just ground fuel that was burnt in this fire, it actually scorched some of the canopy. So as a result, there's a lot of this dead foliage now that's just fallen to the ground and is in, in, in amongst this ash bed. And we've also got all the, the seed capsules that have fallen to the ground from these Blakely's red gums as well. That will end up regenerating uh, in the ash bed and uh, we'll end up with a, a thicker stand of trees, uh, which will also uh, increase um, the fuel load in this particular area. What we've tried to do so that we can understand the extent of the damage that's been done to the site is that we've gone and documented the number of fallen live trees that are now dead and the number of standing dead trees that had hollows in them as well to try and understand what is the scale of this and in a roughly 10 hectare area which is a lot less than 10% of the burnt area, we found that there were over 200 uh, live and dead standing trees that are now nothing but ash. What this means from a wildlife point of view is that there's a huge resource, a very important resource that's been removed from the Warby's 
as a whole. It might sound like our group is against burning, but that's not the case. So I asked Ian and Chris their thoughts on hazard reduction burning. No, it's not that we're against the notion of fuel reduction burning. It's the way that this particular burn has been carried out. Um, it's really had a significant detrimental impact to the ecology of this site. So I think things can certainly be done better going forward so that we don't see this level of destruction uh, occur anywhere again. It's important that we clarify our group is not against uh, burning for, for fuel reduction. We think it's important that there be some fuel control and fire can be a very helpful tool to do that. It's just that the way it's done we have a problem with and possibly when it's done. As a, as a local landholder, um, our property directly abuts the national park just over here. Uh, I don't feel any safer at all. In fact, I think uh, going forward, we're going to be at, at a higher risk because the, the regeneration of, uh, of finer fuels, dense um, regeneration of native veg after the burn uh, will put, it at, put us at, at higher risk than where we were to start with. It's a choice we make as local landholders to live in this, in this bushland environment. We're aware of the fire risks. The responsibility is on us as private landholders to do our own level of fire protection to prevent our properties and, and, and our infrastructure. We appreciate that the authorities want to give us some level of, of fire protect, protection in the event of a bushfire. Personally, I don't believe that burning three kilometres up into the Warby Ovens National Park is giving us the, the level of, of protection that the, that the authorities are say that they're giving us. It's just caused more of an ecological impact that's more worrisome from my point of view. The, the key thing all of us are looking for as a result of, of this activity is to try and ensure that this doesn't occur again, that we don't have more precious habitat removed. We feel that we should have been involved early on in the process before uh, resources and final planning had been decided on this was the area to be burnt because we had many suggestions as to how they could reduce fire risk particularly with respect to fine fuels and possibly offer alternative areas or other ways of doing it. We found that unfortunately it was already set in stone by the time our group got involved. So we've got several suggestions uh, for government so that this doesn't occur again or at least the outcome is poor as this one and they include when the modelling shows up an area that the people who are likely to be involved should be engaged earlier on in the process so that they can add their weight to what the values of that of that site are. As well we would argue that burning at this time of year in these woodlands is especially where there are lots of large trees involved is likely to to lead to negative environmental outcomes because autumn tends to be when the, the hard fuels, the solid fuels are at their driest because they've been cured all over summer. So there needs to be a much finer level of detail and understanding before you go and burn large areas of national park. We would argue that there was not enough due diligence done on this site. There was clearly the ecological values weren't properly, properly considered. And when we raised this with the authorities, we were told that the process for working out where it was going to be burnt was tenure neutral. So even though the Warbies is a green listed national park, its environmental values were not part of the assessment when that was, when that was done. We think that's, that's wrong and needs to be reconsidered. In areas where there's going to be a burn and there isn't local ecological knowledge, part of the process should ensure that, that uh, people from DELT that have that ecological knowledge do a survey that looks closely at what the values are on the site at the time and not relying on, on modelling which at best has very few records and hence gives us a poor outcome. Look, I think if there's uh, more community consultation, uh, at, I mean, as a, as a local ecologist, um, I had some pretty good information on the values of, of this, this site specifically, really get much of a chance to get that across. There's lots of other people that have intimate knowledge of, of their local area. So I think there's, um, there's much uh, better scope for um, you know, improved community consultation prior to these sorts of burns so that we can reach an outcome where significant e ecological assets, you know, threatened species, um, logs, 
large old hollow bearing trees can be better protected. So to summarise this burn did not achieve any meaningful fuel reduction. In fact it's actually led to more fuel on the ground in the form of all these old trees that have crashed to the ground. In the long term this burning is likely to cause regeneration and there's probably going to be more fuel on the ground than there was to begin with. There has been significant irreversible environmental damage has occurred on this green listed site. Please share this video and engage with your local members and your local community about any planned burns in your area. Make sure the proper ecological foundations have been done. We want to prevent this utter devastation from happening in your area or happening again. I want to thank all the members that got together and tried to stop this burn and have helped make this video possible. We did our best but unfortunately we couldn't stop this from happening. I sincerely hope that this video will highlight to the authorities the damage that they've done here and to help prevent it from happening in the future.